Okay, so, um, hello, I'm BDL. The purpose of the session uh, that we're having right now is for there to be an opportunity for Debian developers who are present here at DevConf to get a chance to meet the members of the technical committee who are present um, and for us to have some conversation about uh, any topics related to uh, interactions with the technical committee that you think might be more productive to do in person at DevConf than through all of the other modes of communication that are at various times available to us. But this is something we've been doing now at DevConf every year for a lot of years. I know it goes back at least as far as Edinburgh because I remember that session distinctly for several reasons. I think we started there. Uh... That might be the first time we did it. Um, so that certainly means, you know, eight-ish years. And um, some years have been much more interesting than others. <coughs> I think it has something to do with um, what the current topics of interest are in front of the committee. I was intrigued as I was in the last few minutes before we got started because I hadn't noticed that this was happening today until someone asked me 20 or so minutes ago if I was planning to come. Um, and so <laughs> I perhaps feel slightly it. less prepared than sometimes, but um, that's okay. Uh, I am currently the longest standing member of the technical committee, which means thanks to the general resolution uh, that we all collectively passed last year. December 31st this year will be my last day as a participant on the technical committee. And Steve, I believe you are the second most length of service person at this point. I, I think that's correct. I at don't least remember for the, the tie-breaking uh, rule. Well, uh, uh, well uh, for, from the terms of the general resolution, he is actually we are both at the same time of amount in the committee. But right. for the resolution, he is a bit longer than I by whatever non-time, non but so I have, so, I so have the a chance to be a more year on the committee. So the good news is you get the benefit uh, that those of us who are actually present at DevConf this year represent long lengths of service in the technical committee and can therefore you know, speak reasonably authoritatively about things that have happened for quite a while. Uh, the bad news is that um, your credit cards will only go so far with us because after the end of this year, uh, Steve and I will no longer be members of the technical committee. By the way, that was a joke. Um, <coughs> That's so right. This the credit cards still work. You just don't get much for it. Right. Or something, or something <laughs> like that. So this is the list of people who are currently members of the technical committee. Those whose names are italicized, I believe, are not present this year. And um, Didier is... Didier will be present. Will be present, but is not in the room yet. Okay, fine. Um, Keith Packard sends his regrets. Uh, unfortunately, his employer <coughs> um, <laughs> suggested that he give a keynote at LinuxCon in North America uh, this week instead of being here. Um, sorry, Keith. Um, and yeah, uh, Don Armstrong is now the tech committee chairman and unfortunately also could not be here. Um, in fact, somebody pointed out to me, I think it was about nine years-ish that I served as chair of the technical committee. And uh, I decided early this year that in light of the fact that the end of December would be the end of my tenure on the tech committee because of the term limiting resolution, that in order to make sure we had a nice smooth transition, letting someone else have a chance to take over as chairman before I was off the committee entirely uh, was a good thing to do. And Don, um, has suggested that you know that's probably a good pattern for the future. At the beginning of the year that would be the last year of someone's term, uh, it might be a good time for there to be a transition of the committee chairmanship. And we'll just see how this all works going forward. Not a big deal. Um, so what is the technical committee about? <coughs> the technical committee is one of the uh, entities within the Debian project whose existence is defined within our constitution specifically Section 6. Um, the members of the committee are appointed by the Debian project leader and the existing committee members. The way this has worked in practice for the last few years is that the committee has come up with a list of proposed new members whenever there was a vacancy or a, or a need to add people uh, and has proposed that list of candidates to the project leader who in effect has, uh, well, so far the 
project leaders always agreed with the technical committee, and <coughs> uh, that's how we've gotten new members. Uh, there has been, for those of you who've been paying attention, there has been more change in the membership of the committee in the last year than at any time in at least a decade. Um, and not surprisingly, mm -hmm. this is because of the consequences of the stress level that was imposed on the committee by you know, the events of the preceding year. <coughs> System D. Um, I'm, you know, <coughs> it, at some point, I think all of us who participate in the technical committee understand um, that these are things that we agree to do, not so much because they're exciting or fun, um, but because somebody has to be willing to be the place where decisions happen. And somebody has to be willing to take on the things that other people in the project can't somehow successfully resolve on their own. And that is, in effect, what the Constitution defines. I'm not going to go through all of this. We've talked about it a bunch before. If anyone has questions about um, sort of the constitutional bounding of the roles of the committee, feel free to ask, and we can go into that when we start the discussion part. The committee has, since the... DebConf that was held in Banja Luka, uh, attempted to have roughly uh, monthly regular uh, meetings on IRC to discuss open issues, and frankly, to sort of goad each other into action. Um, it's just a reality that without deadlines, nothing ever gets done. <clears throat> and so the notion that people have to-do list items they can report on in a monthly IRC meeting has, in some ways, helped us to make progress on items which would otherwise perhaps not get as much attention. Um, the difficulty, of course, is that um, when I went to pull up the list of open issues before the committee at this time, um, it was really simple. I copied last year's list and added one more at the bottom. <coughs> <laughs> and so on some level, while there have been things that have been discussed and some items that have been closed in the last year, I can't say that I feel terribly great about what's been accomplished. Yeah. Didn't we decide on the aptitude one? Yeah, I think that one. The bug is still open in the BTS. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, yeah, it, it seems we need to close the bug. Uh, right. Uh, so, <laughs> okay, fine. Um, decision's been made. The process hasn't been run to completion. The point that I'm trying to make is that there are some things that have been open issues for some time. In, in all honesty, the first item here, you know, the proposed constitutional fix for the tech committee supermajority, we collectively agreed that the right thing to do was to not act on that in the heat of passion after the Init system discussion, that what we should do instead, since the combination of the intensity of that discussion leading uh, to some changes in tech committee membership and the fact that the term uh, limit resolution was at that time already being discussed and was headed for general resolution. We decided the right answer was to let some of these things um, be dealt with after the dust settled. I don't know whether though that particular item is one that we'll try to come to any closure on. The first, first one is one of those w which I'm going to tackle in the second half of this year, which is okay. now started, but yeah, uh, it's not good to make such discussions in the heat. Basically, we have an we have an off by one error in our constitution for any supermajority decision because, as the constitution says, if you want to have something by majority of, of n to one, you need to have n to one plus one vote, which is not bad with the de de developers at large because we are so many it's people voting. Population. But in a small body like the technical committee, it means that you, if you say you just three to one majority and six people vote, then it needs uh, that you need to have five people for a three to one majority, which is, yeah. Uh, so it's really just off by one error, which we, ca which we could fix. Um, yeah. And in the same context, there have been discussions about other things that we might want to address regarding the composition of the technical committee. In particular, the point has been made that there are some simple cases of voting where having an odd number of members might lead to less likelihood of an even tie than having an even number of members. But since we all understand that Condorcet voting behavior means that if there are more than two choices on a ballot, um, 
the it gets combinatoric very quickly. I don't know that that's something that there, anyone feels any particular urgency about dealing uh, with. Peter, uh, and frankly speaking, we have had many votes in, uh, recently. I can just remember one vote where we have, where we were split a bit about everything <coughs> else. It's <laughs> actually two votes, but one issue. So well, yes. it's, I would say it's <coughs> three enough. votes, but anyways. Okay. Fine. Uh, uh, but, uh, <laughs> can can, but, can but you tell <laughs> we all feel like that was? But uh, but in fact for, for 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 most issues, uh, when we have a solution, we say we we conduct one or two ways to solve it, and then it's very soon very obvious what the majority is. Yeah. So it's not so important. And with the one, uh, well, whatever rules we had, uh, we need to come to a decision, which we did. Uh, yes. So that, that's where we are. I think the situation, honestly, is that the majority of topics that are brought to the technical committee do end up having a sense of consensus form around them, regardless of what the boundary conditions are in the constitutional voting rules. The problem is that when we have an issue that is as contentious as the one we dealt with a year or so ago, um, the, 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 the anxiety about those boundary conditions just makes the whole thing harder. So these are things that we will eventually fix because we'd like to not ever have any of our successors go through quite the same degree of stress that we had to go through. And Definitely. frankly, that's kind of where that lists. Um, yeah, uh, the menu system one. Um, I'm not sure where that currently stands. So the situation with that one is that there is a a draft ballot um, in the last IRC meeting, I raised concerns. So basically, there's there's two views within the committee at the moment. Um, obviously, there's um, you know there's a fraught social issue with regards to um, was this the right way for it to be handled, and then there's also the question of what the technical policy should be. Um, and different members of the uh, technical committee come down and. In, in uh, different directions on what what the, the committee as a whole should be focused on um, when addressing this question. Um, and so it was kind of left at the end of that IRC meeting that um, I have the opportunity to draft a ballot option that draws on Keith's proposed technical solution um, and get that on the ballot. Um, I also made it clear during that meeting that I couldn't promise I would get to that in a timely manner. Um, in which case the vote may go ahead with the current set of ballot options. Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know how we'll come down to this. I, this is probably one of those topics about which, if there are folks in the room that have strong opinions, it could be an interesting thing for us to have some conversation about here. Um, not that we haven't already had some. <laughs> um, and then I guess the new item uh, that was not present on the list last year was the plan for cross tool chain packages. Um, I've lost track of the current status of that. We have provided advice and mediation. I don't think that I believe at the moment this is going to lead to the tech committee actually voting on something. But I'm not certain that uh, what the current uh, status is. Well, uh, I would say we have made some progress. I believe that at the end probably we will be voting on something like that we uh, uh, just to, to formally end the topic saying that we uh, th that we are happy to see some blockers or something like that, So, but not a decision voting. Right, okay. So with that, um, I think we're more than happy to open things up to questions, and I hope that you have some interesting ones for us. Hi. Uh, hi, this is Andre. Um, uh, I have actually a question related to past uh, past issue. Well, what to do if the other party uh, is openly hostile after the decision is made? Because uh, if you remember, we did a lot of hoop jumping before the Jesse release with the libjpeg transition, mm -hmm. because um, the the decision didn't list exactly what to do, and when I made uh, the most reasonable thing, it was not met with success, and we had to rename the packages and, and do a lot of weird stuff because uh, yeah. because the, the other party was, was not, well, very warm in regards of the decision. When do you guys want to try and tackle that? 
what happens when the, the party on the losing side of a decision, if you want to call it that, um, is not amenable to actually implementing what was directed? I mean, that's kind of what, uh, yeah. So, I mean, if we're clear about what we've decided as a committee, then no Debian developer has the authority to act against such a decision, and any member of the technical committee can do an NMU to implement a decision. Um, and we've said that before, that like it, in some cases, if there's a, a maintainer override, that maybe we should just be prepared to do the NMU for it. Um, I think we probably haven't followed through on that yeah. necessarily. Uh, basically, I mean, in cases, in, in cases where the committee, a committee actually decides to overrule a maintainer, of course, we don't do that light uh, or just, just easily. It's hard for us to do, but if we do, we think that our decision then is, or that we have very good reasons to do so. And what I think, or what we, have, we, we I ask every developer to say, okay, this is now a policy uh, which is set by the committee, and then please uh, extend this policy in an, or basically there are reasons for it, and so please try to, to, to see what, we, or, or try to follow it up reasonably, so we don't have, uh, or there could be, be, there could be parts we didn't spell out in our solution, but basically just interpret it meaningfully and not, oh yes, it's, this is exactly is the law, and if I, and there is a small passage I could go through without being punished, because it's not the way we, we, we write our text. We write our text more in technical specification, and not a, uh, so please, yeah, try to read it as it, you think uh, it's sensible that, I mean, if you say, well, you think something is very wrong in our solution, for example, you think we, we need to do this, and we are forbidden to, to do that in a spe specific way. That doesn't mean that you can, should do it now another way, but rather that we don't want to have it except, uh, as, uh, except if we specify it otherwise, and if you have doubts, please ask us first. So I think uh, there was an issue in the past where we explicitly forbid something, and then it was done in a, in a similar but not, not direct forbidden way, which is, of course, not what we, what we meant. So. so that, of course, speaks to the case of a, of a maintainer being... Um, shall we say unconstructive either in their interpretation of yeah of I, I think from the, a maintainer the point of view it's not unconstructive um, but I think the question here was about um, well or at least one aspect of the question is uh, you know the, the technical committee can say what the policy should be for the archive the technical committee cannot make any member of the Debian project do the work to implement that right um, of and not. so ultimately if we make a decision um, that, that does effectively authorize the other party to do an NMU if, if they are um, inclined to do so. Um, or they can ask the technical committee to actually do the archive upload. Um, but and I think in some cases where the resolution of the issue sort of involved um, providing advice and guidance to the archive maintainers on what to accept or not accept or, you know, something like that. Yep. So. But yeah, I think Steve makes a really excellent point here. And this is something that we had a lot of discussion about within the committee during the init system debate. And that is that there's sort of a distinction between making a decision about what the right solution is or the thing that we would most like to see happen and the fact that we don't really have the authority to make anybody do any actual work. Because we are all in Debian volunteers. We're here for lots of different reasons, lots of different motivations. Some of us get paid more than others to do the things that we do for Debian, but uh, nobody in Debian has the right to tell somebody else what to do. You can say, this is the right solution, that one's the wrong solution, and if the only thing that you want to do is the thing that was the wrong solution, sorry, you lose. But we can't make people do work. And given that, it does put some constraints on this. It means that uh, any solution that's proposed, somebody has to willing, be willing to actually do the work to implement it. And you know, if we run into situations where <coughs> uh, a decision is rendered and uh, one of the folks involved believes that somebody's being actively obstructionist about it, then we ought to have some further conversation about that. There's certainly other things the project can do to try and correct situations where somebody's actively obstructing progress in the archive. But um, I, I'm not really sure what else we would say productively about that. Yeah. 
the, the obvious follow-up question would be, should I, uh, well, continue discussion um, for the issue before, or should I open a new issue if I want to clean up the mess that was created during the transition, like having libjpg turbo instead of uh, prox, instead of just libjpg prox, uh, and and the other stuff that was created. So the the, 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 so the preferred resolution would always be that you come up with some plan to do that kind of cleanup, straightening up, making things right again, without having to come to the tech committee for a decision, right? And if it's possible to work with other people in the project to achieve those objectives, great. If you can't, then yes. Um, if, if the situation is different now, but there's a new issue that ought to be resolved, open a new new bug and let's have that conversation in the committee. There's no problem with that at all. Um, if the issue, if the underlying issue really is fundamentally one or more individuals trying to obstruct the decision, a decision that the committee's already taken, then that's something that we probably need to have a conversation with the DPL about and or, uh, you know, <coughs> The remedies provided by our Constitution are sort of interesting. You know, if we, if we have somebody who's really behaving badly, you know, the ultimate choice is to evic, evict them from the project. That's a pretty big hammer. It's been used a couple of times in the past. We don't use that one lightly. That's a much harder hammer to swing than even making a tech committee decision. So, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, and, and so I think sometimes we have to think a little bit about what is it we really want to accomplish. And in your case, if there is some path to achieving, you know, the right technical solution without having to jump through a lot of procedural hoops, i.e., without having to come to the tech committee or go to the DPL to complain about somebody's behavior or something like this, great. But if there are things that are getting in the way of your being able to make progress in Debian and be successful, then don't be afraid to come get help, because that's what we're here for. Other questions? Yeah. Should Debian have a technical committee that also engages in designing and planning stuff, um, something that is currently forbidden by the Constitution? I assume you have an opinion. No, it's just a question. Maybe it's a, it it's a, qu it's a question with the idea of we can't make people do something idea. Um. So I've always personally thought that there is definitely room for leadership within a project like Debian. Uh, when I was running for and successfully elected to be DPL, I spent a lot of time thinking about who ought to sort of have what roles and responsibilities where. And I articulated at that time that I thought one of the things the DPL could do is to shine a light on areas that they thought needed more attention or where more hands would make things work well. Way back in the day when I was running for DPL, the big issues were internationalization in the installer. Uh, I forget what else. They, there were several issues where I thought, okay, if I talk about this, and I talk about it being important and more people want to work on it, that would cause a positive thing to happen. I believe that we have spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to think of the technical committee as an organization that exists only to sort of make decisions of last resort because if you get really proactive about trying to sort of make decisions in advance, you really constrain the sense of what people think they can work on. And in a place like Debian that is as much a duocracy as we are, meaning the people who are actually willing to do the work get to sort of in some way define what the, the technical direction is, it, it's, it's, it's dispiriting if the thing you care about turns out to not be one of the things that gets laid out as part of a vision or articulated. So I personally have gone back and forth on this. I don't know whether it's important for the technical committee to be the place where, you know, the sort of big design decisions about the future get made, but I would like somehow, somewhere in the project, there to be some sense of what the objectives are, what the vision is, what 
the opportunities are, what the things are that we could do if we just cared enough to go work on them. Um, ac actually, I, I, I think it's really a feature that Hegel probably doesn't do this design work, because if you do design work and then have ideas that are not uh, popular in the, in the project, and then who should do the decision? The ones who like the ideas do you design? Not a good idea. Uh, on the other hand, there are places in the project where we could do design work. Uh, for example, there's a policy team which could uh, be more involved if they would have time and would like to do it. There are lots of other places. So if somebody says, okay, or a group of, pe of people says, you want to do more, more design work and it shows that it's helpful for the project, I'm quite sure they get support uh, from all over the project and they could, uh, do influ uh, or could influence the project. Uh, but I don't think that the committee would be the ap uh, appropriate place for that. Yeah, so I'll say that I have never interpreted the Constitution's wording about detailed design work as a prohibition, um, as opposed to a statement that this is not the work that the project should expect from the committee. So I think, yeah. I think there has been a view that at various points I feel has hamstrung the committee in, in resolving some issues where there was a contentious issue and it needed somebody to actually dig into it um, and 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 suss out the 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 true technical right answer um, there, there have to the been, extent that there is such a thing. There have been times when the question was, you know, should we do A or B? And the members of the technical committee looked at it and went, that's a bad choice to have to make because neither one of those is really good. It would be better if we did something else. And the temptation then is to go start thinking about what the right answer is. And I think this is where the tension exists in the actual existing practices of the committee is when is it okay for us to think beyond the question that was actually asked of us? And when things get complicated and messy, my tendency always is to want to step back and say, okay, what was the question that we were originally asked? What, what are we actually supposed to be making a decision about? And sometimes that helps simplify things. Sometimes it really doesn't. But in this case, I think we're really, <coughs> it sort of depends on what you mean. I, I, I don't, there, there are, there's sort of a distinction in my mind between engaging in some design activity in the process of answering a question that's brought to the committee versus a situation of, gee, you know, who's the body that's supposed to sort of provide the vision for the future? I will admit that I've been disappointed in the last several DPL election cycles that our platforms haven't had more long-range vision content. I am, of course, really pleased every time I read somebody's platform and recognize verbiage that I authored in 2002 because I like thinking that, you know, ideas that I had or collected from other people and took as my own have, you know, become part of the culture of the project. But when I don't see something new and shiny to aspire to, I'm a little disappointed. And so, you know, maybe in the future, folks writing DPL platforms might think about, you know, what would cause BDL to get enthusiastic again and, <coughs> you know, add that to your list of things to worry about. Or not, I'm only one vote, right? <laughs> but um, I, I don't know, it's a really good question. If you have an opinion or others in the room have an opinion about this, speak up. And of, of course, I, I read the Constitution similar to you. So it's not that I, that I personally must not do the sign work. That's definitely not in it. And also we as committee, we sometimes we, we do uh, take a deeper look at things and say, okay, now if this is, is wrong and that is wrong for another reason and isn't there another way to do it. But I don't think that we should be the group of people who actively drive uh, the, the vision how they're going to look, look like. That's the wrong group for it. But sometimes there, are, there is an overlap of people who are in the committee who are doing other roles do that, and that's great. Right, and also when you get right down to it, even, even if the folks who were on the committee had the desire to try to impose some sort of top-down vision for Debian, which I don't think anybody who's ever been elected to the committee has viewed it that way. Um, m most of the time, the people who are sitting on the committee um, find it enough work to keep up with the issues that are actually brought to the committee without going looking for more work as the committee. Um, you know, you might have individual members who are still out there participating in design discussions in the mailing lists in Debian Devel and, and on wikis and 
and having conversations with, with developers as peers, which is quite a different thing than trying to get a resolution passed by the committee to say that this is a thing that Debian should do, which is just, that's just overhead. I would also like to suggest that those of you that have um, a strong interest in the technical committee and have been around the project for a while and done some useful things, um, take note of the fact that at the end of this calendar year, there will be two positions on the committee that are becoming open. So that means that sometime this fall, we'll put out a call for you know nominations, self-nominations, whatever, of people who might be interested in serving on the technical committee, committee starting in January. I certainly hope the committee, rest of the committee doesn't decide to wait until January to start that process. And so I would encourage all of you to have conversations with your friends and peers here at DevConf about what do you think is important? What would you like to see happen differently? Um, I don't want to sort of specifically speak for anybody else, but I know that Sam Hartman has been very clear about the fact that he thinks there are some things about how the current committee membership has behaved that uh, he'd like to see us do differently. And he's been very willing to engage in conversation. And I really have welcomed his input into those discussions, even if sometimes we're approaching a situation from very different viewpoints. Yeah, and maybe once your term has expired, you can run for DPL again? <laughs> <laughs> I told somebody once that the problem with me running for DPL is that the two times I ran and was not elected, each time I got a newer, bigger job at HP, and um, now you're back at the HP, so it would work again. Yeah, but I'm already a fellow in the office of the CTO. The, 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 anything I could go do up from here just is too much responsibility. So <laughs> <coughs> I, I don't know. That, that feels dangerous. So See, I, you, you took a much more laid back approach to this question of, of thinking about the nominations. I was going to say, I was going to let people know that the doors are going to be locked at the end of 45 minutes. And... <laughs> Nobody's allowed out until we come up with four nominees for the technical <laughs> committee. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd be allowed to nominate people not in the room, by the way, too. <laughs> so the process we've used the last couple times, um, just you know, for those of you who haven't been paying attention, the process we've we used is we've put out a call for nominations. People have nominated themselves or others. The people who did not nominate themselves, we've checked with them to find out if they were okay with being nominated. And then, uh, and uh, interestingly, a number of people who were nominated said, nope, not on your life, um, for different reasons, and that's fine. Um, and then the technical committees had a private discussion about the merits of including each of those individuals on the committee. While as a project we are intensely focused on being open about all the things we do, in all honesty, the kinds of conversations we're having about people uh, who were nominated are just not appropriate for a public list. And so uh, that's the way that process has worked. We then always take the slate of candidates that we are considering and put them to a publicly visible vote before they're taken to uh, the project leader for review and approval. And so I think that combination has worked out pretty well. Um, but again, I would strongly encourage any of you who think you might have something add, to add in the committee context to consider uh, nominating yourself or nominating somebody else you think is appropriate. It's honestly not a lot of work for us to contact people and ask if they're willing to be considered as nominees. We're more than happy to do that. So uh, if you have a list of people you think might be interesting to see on the committee, don't be afraid to give us the list. Um. Just something in addition to what you said, um, at least since the last time we had more people on our, uh, there's, there's a basically a list of people we are discussing about, that are the people who are either self-nominated Sam, or, or accepted the nomination, and then not uh, the list of people who were now added to the committee is not the full list of people who we consider acceptable. <laughs> so don't think because we are nominated and not accepted that we consider you as non-acceptable, uh, so, but uh, we, we don't want to make the decision pu public which nominees we consider acceptable and which not, and I hope that is okay, or I, I personally wouldn't like to do that. There's another comment I'll add there. Um, yes, give, give the tech committee your nominations, but also if there are people that you think would be good on the technical committee, um, don't be afraid to talk to them yes, about please. it yeah. as well. 
because if, if they only see that from, from the technical committee, I think it's possibly they view it differently than if they get it from their peers. Um, and I Actually, think in the last cycle, the folks who said no had strong reasons for saying no that were unrelated to where the nomination was coming from. But your point's a really good one. This is, this is we are in Debian a social organization on some level. And people understanding the sense of value that you place on their opinions and interests and, you know, in effect, bolstering their willingness to take one for the team and go do something that is, at best, some work and, at worst, really, really stressful um, is probably a great thing to do. And, frankly, I suspect that in the next few years, I, I hope we don't have any more situations like we did around the init system discussion. That was, that was the single most unusual and contentious issue the technical committee has ever dealt with. And, um, and I it's, it's very, very uh, worse than the other one. So it's not just a bit, but it's order, really order, much worse. Order of magnitude difference. Really. I, I was going to put the issue before the technical committee to ask if we should switch from a Linux to a BSD kernel by default. Do you think maybe that would we be could a have much some easier question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect the committee would come to consensus on that fairly quickly. <laughs> Oh, feel free, you know. <coughs> I'm sure, I'm sure, you know. Uh, nope, sorry. I won't still be around next April. Well, sorry. <coughs> Any other questions? Oh, come on. Okay. Uh, we, 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 st we still have 20 minutes left, so we can't uh, uh, finish it early. <laughs> well, we can. But uh, okay, I have seen a question from an ex- Member. It's not actually 20 minutes. We're supposed to end early and let the camera people go home. I, I, I had a, um, so I noticed there was this, this business with the, the cross tool chain stuff. And right. I read that bug report and it, it really, um, it, it was the, the, the initial re referral to the TC was, was a beautiful piece of writing and really um, in other circumstances you would have been, you know, uplifted by it. But the facts that were revealed in that bug report were disturbing and I worry that mails like that are sent not generally sent to the TC because the person who would want to send such a mail fears that the relationship with the maintainer that they're complaining about would be even further damaged by it. And I would like to ask the TC members what suggestions they have for people who are in that position and what they are going to do to make that problem easier? Um, well, if you have an issue that might belong before, uh, in front of the technical committee or basically where you need help, um, you could contact any of us um, off list, this means with a private email. There is also a non-public uh, mailing list for the committee, so we could forward things there. Uh, so please, if you if you say okay, it's a difficult issue. In, in, in that bug report, it's basically a disagreement between the maintainer and a group of other people on how to behave uh, or, on, on, or how to uh, address uh, certain topics. Which is, I agree with you. Uh, the, the mail is not so nice. Uh, so yeah, please contact us uh, uh, private, uh, and uh, we will provide other means of communication when, where we hope to make it as less uh, difficult with the maintainer as possible. Of course, as soon as somebody else starts speaking with the maintainer, um, yeah, I mean, that is basically a, a, a social conflict involved, not only technical, but a social in some cases. In social conflicts, uh, we can do, uh, try to help as good as we could, but uh, none of us is now in, is, is, is now in uh, let's say, uh, none of us works as a social conflict resolver, but we all have other technical roles. So, yeah. We can try to do our best, but and if you want to discuss it off-list, you, ca you can, of course. I was just going to say that the reality <laughs> is that this has been happening a lot for a long time. Um, there are a lot of things, at least I've had people come and ask me questions about, gee, how do you think I should handle this? You know, Do you have some advice or guidance that you could give me about this on topics, many of which have never ended up you know, being publicly surfaced? In fact, 
I realized at the end of the one year term that I spent as Debian project leader that one of the problems was so many of the things that had been brought to me during that year were things that we found some quiet resolution to that I think people looking at my term in office went, well, he didn't do a damn thing now, did he? Um, <coughs> and there's a tension there somehow because it would be really good if everyone in the project understood that there were avenues that you could pursue to have uh, you know, get some advice and guidance and maybe help resolve a problem. But it's hard to know how to sort of publicize quiet resolutions being successful. At least I've never really figured out a good way to do it um, without somehow seeming horribly self-serving in the process. And so, you know, we've certainly talked about, and I know over the last two or three years, we've a couple times in other DebConf Tech Committee boffs and in other venues, uh, espouse the opinion that people want to approach us, as Andy just said, in, in other ways. We're happy to have that happen. I'm happy to just say that here again today. Um, if any of you have some frustration that's you know bubbling up and you just don't really know how to make things better instead of making things worse with an email, come find a, one of us this week and let's have a conversation and see if we can't help you figure out how to make some progress. Uh, well, I, I can remember at least one case where the discussion ended up in a special buff on, the, on a DEPCONF held by one of the technical committee members to, uh, uh, or uh, moderated by one of them, to get both parties uh, starting to agree at least a bit. Uh, yeah, we could do that if and it's useful. And we have, we have, in fact, approached third parties sometime where we knew the two folks in question who were having some kind of conflict were going to be at the same event that wasn't a Debian event and have asked somebody else to, you know, w would they be willing to sit and sort of moderate a face-to-face -face conversation between those folks? And uh, uh, I certainly have personally offered to throw some cash on the table to cover the cost of some beers or something if that would help lubricate the conversation. And, you know, things like that do help sometimes um, because, again, you know, part of the reason that I have for so long been such a strong supporter of the idea of getting good corporate sponsorship for DebConf and for other events like this is I know that those of us who have a chance to come to events like this and get to know each other and have some meals together, have some drinks together, you know, form personal social relationships, just don't have the ability to fight with each other in the same way as people who've never met in any way other than an online communication. And I think that's really important. And so part of what I've certainly tried to do over the years is look for as many opportunities as possible to get people to communicate with each other better. And sometimes, you know, that's by asking, you know, a calm third party to invite them both to go to dinner somewhere or something. Um, and sometimes it's been, by sending an email to somebody and saying, do you really have any idea just how what you're saying publicly is being perceived? You know, have you thought about sort of how the other person feels about this and <clears throat> why what you're saying is making things worse instead of better? We do a lot of that. And I guess it's probably, I, thanks for the question, Ian, because I think it's probably worth saying out loud here that, you know, I, I know I do and I know that, that Annie and Steve have talked about examples too. I think. I think all of us on the committee at one time or another have those sorts of interactions with people and we hope they make things better. And honestly, while I'm totally happy for us to have more items come to the committee that need to be addressed by the committee, I'm every bit as happy, maybe even happier, if the project just works well without issues having to be brought to the committee because that's what we all want. We want somehow to be able to collaborate in an efficient and effective way with each other to make the world a better place. Other questions? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, can I, by next DebConf, uh, be policy compliant by ignoring the Debian menu? I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand the question. Can I, by, by next DebConf, be policy compliant by ignoring the Debian menu? Good question. We will see, we will see that and we voted about it. Have you looked over the, the draft policy language that Keith had started putting together on this? Uh, I haven't reviewed it recently myself, so I can't. I don't think he had sent it to anyone in his Correct. It's in, it's in the Git. I, it's, it's in the, the technical committee's Git repository as a draft. It's not been sent to any mailing lists yet. I, I have been 
waiting for it to be posted to I mean in respect yeah, you, 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 I, I think it's successful for everyone. Well, it certainly is. He, it should be published. So, so he's been waiting for that. I'm just saying yes. that in terms of, of what the answer to your specific question is, I don't recall what it was that Keith recommended there to address the, the particulars. I do think that ultimately, um, yes, the answer should be that yes, you should not have to interact with two menu systems in your package. However, there's details about how the system should t treat those two menu systems to ensure compatibility and ensure that the system can use working for our users um, and not just I understand the, the viewpoint that the menu system is is not something that uh, maintainers of packages that interface with the free desktop system want to be dealing with. Um, however, just dropping it on the floor has impact for other places other where we have integration yep. today. So, but in this, uh, but I think it would be helpful if you could review what is uh, what is in the draft, and if you don't find it, uh, um, uh, please send an email to uh, say to me, so uh, if any, to any of us, and we can send you the text. Because so, I, so yeah. I actually smell an action item here. We should probably go to the tech committee's page in the WN.org web stuff and make sure there's a explicit pointer to our repo and an invitation yeah. to people to review drafts there. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know that we've ever officially done that. We sort of created a Git repo at some point because it was the obvious way to collaborate on creating drafts of new documents. But uh, even I sometimes have to stop and go, oh, yeah, right. It's probably in the repo. So um, we could probably make that a little more obvious. Put it on, on, on the web page, yeah. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll try and remember to do that this evening. Any other Good. questions? Okay, then, thank you all for showing up. Yes, uh, thank you very much.